I'm here with former Sheriff Van Duncan from Buncombe County, and he's thinking about running for the County Commission. And Van, you have been through a lot in Buncombe County, and you've got just a storied history with law enforcement and just service to the community. Tell me why at this stage in your life you want to run for County Commissioner. Well, I received a call a week ago Thursday uh, from a pretty collective group of the community, mainly business owners and some folks who had started some coalitions here in Asheville around public safety and some of the issues that we're facing. And, uh, you know, I've been telling these folks, you've got to stand up and get your community back. Well, they kind of pushed it back on me and said, you got to help us. And they, they decided, because I do have a history in service with here in Buncombe County, that I might be a good candidate for them, that folks might recognize my name, and, and hopefully I still hold some trust with them and, and being honest and transparent and putting out what the issues are. And, you know, in all honesty, I had, to, I had to pray about it, had to talk to my family about it, and I think you know when you start down a road like this whether you're supposed to do it or not, and every door I've knocked on has been open, uh, which it's been a short period of time. It's been a week, week and a day. So um, I feel like this is a really good opportunity because of, of what has gone on, uh, the commissioner's displeasure with the Asheville Police Department making arrests to help the businesses downtown. Um, I think we need to have a really in-depth discussion about what our trajectory is here in the county and the city and how council and commission can come alongside with law enforcement on some of these issues to help us get to a better place. Van, I have heard that the uh, commission opposed some of the things that the Asheville Police Department did. Why do you think they made that sort of decision? Well, I think the commissioners uh, have committed down a path around population reduction in the jail. And I do get some of the strategy around that, but there's a, there's a very left-leaning foundation that has funded counties all over the United States. Well, I think 52 in all. Uh, to reduce jail populations, and their name's the MacArthur Foundation, and you can you can find out about them. They've kind of moved away from this reinvesting in justice and and this reimagining justice because in a lot of the counties and cities that have taken this money, committed to this plan of reducing jail population, it's all based around getting those numbers down without any kind of taking a look, well, how does that affect your public safety? How does that affect in your crime rates? The other cities that have done this, and, and it has not worked well for them, of course the county takes the grant, but the county provides the jail that services the city municipalities that, that bring folks to, to put them in jail uh, when they've broken the law. The cities that are included in that list are Chicago, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Charlotte Mecklenburg. And I can tell you, Charlotte got the grant before we did, and when I started looking at their numbers, they went up 100%. They doubled their homicide rate in one year. And uh, I think we are committed to a strategy that is a single issue focus on numbers in the jail as opposed to who are we holding on to? Are we being effective about uh, lowering our violent crime rate. And I can tell you it's gone up in the city. It's held about the same out in the county. What a lot of people think is jail is, is just a horrible place. Well, it's not a great place to, to be, but some of the things that it does offer is there are some, there is some programming in the jail to try to move people out of their issues. A lot of it has to deal with addiction. Uh, current Sheriff Quentin Miller touted one of the reasons why they've had a reduction in property crime is they have used medically assisted treatment, the MAT program, in the jail. And, and what I'm trying to get across with that is there is successful programming in the jail that takes place. So sometimes when these people pass through the jail, they actually get some help that is meaningful to them and effective in moving them out of the issue. So we have to quit looking at the jail as like, you know, the Marquis de Sade in a dungeon because that's not what it is. Uh, so that's not, 
that's certainly not the solution for most issues, but for some people uh, who continue to engage in criminal activity and really hurt your quality of life, especially with what they've seen downtown, that, that's that got to be part of the strategy to move it in a different direction. I'll say this, I've worked in prison ministries. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that turn their life around. One of the, I'm not gonna drop his name, but one of the one of the most successful businessmen I know of in Mitchell County spent time in jail, spent some time in prison, changed the decisions, the direct direct the trajectory of his life, and became a very successful and a great father and grandfather and, and a community member. It happens all the time, doesn't it? it it's not the do all end all to end somebody's uh, but life. But for some people, it's going to be the only thing. It's going to be the deciding factor. And I I got to tell you. Some of the best interaction I've seen and, and feeling like we're making a difference was sitting in drug court and watching some of these folks come through and saying, hey, I had hit rock bottom. I was either going to go to prison for a long period of time or I was going to die. And drug court and the accountability that came with, me, with it caused me to look at things differently, caused me to start behaving in a different way and looking at the world in a different way, and it, it turned my life around and it saved me. And I'm gonna tell you, those are some powerful stories. Van, every time I come to Buncombe County to visit, um, I notice there seems to be more and more of a problem with the homeless folks. And uh, do you think you, you bring any solutions to the table or any things we can do to progress the problems that are arising because of homelessness? I think we have to look outside of what we've been doing because what we've been doing, I don't think anybody's going to argue, has not been effective. And because we offer a certain amount of services and, and things here in Buncombe County uh, and we do allow people to live on the street, uh, we've seen those numbers of homeless that refuse to go into shelter continue to multiply here. Uh, we've got some really good partners uh, with Scott Rogers and ABCCM and with Mike Woods and the Rescue Mission. We've got some people who have been very successful with the population of homeless that are honestly just down on their luck. They're, they're looking for help. They need a hand up and they're, they're wanting to change the trajectory of their life. Where we fail is that, and I, and I asked some of these shelter providers, what do you think that percentage is of homeless folks that just refuse to go in shelter? And it was higher than what I thought. They said about 20%. And those 20%, we spin our wheels and, and use a lot of resources that could probably be better used in those effective programs, not that we don't need to address that 20%. But uh, we seem not to be effective in, in moving them out of their situation. Here's where I get really upset. I watch city council meetings. I watch county commission meetings. I see these left-wing activists come in and they say police are horrible. They're arresting folks just because they're homeless. And they conflate that 80% of folks who are looking and wanting help that we can help and effectively impact them in a positive way, they conflate that with the 20% that probably uh, law enforcement needs to deal with because of breaking the law. That 20%, they happen to be homeless, but they're engaged in criminal activity and they're doing things that studies have shown decrease their life expectancy by 25 years. So the activists come in and they point the finger and they say, you folks are cruel, you have no heart, you don't want to help the homeless folks. These are people that you know have fallen down on their luck. What I want to say to them is it's not cruel to try to keep them from living on the street and to hold them accountable. What is cruel is to continue to leave them on the street. Because even though we may feed them, we provide them with needles and a, and a harm reduction strategy, which is a, a whole issue into itself that needs to be looked at. Uh, even though we do those things and we allow them in some places to camp and live outside a shelter, that's cruel. I see these folks walking up and down the street and I think, you know, how miserable that has to be. Uh, a lot of these folks have mental health issues that need treatment, and the only way that's going to happen is to bring them into shelter and provide those resources, along with housing them, feeding them. Uh, to me, that's the, that's the humane solution. There have to be some programs that have addressed this. Have, have, have you looked at uh, other solutions 
other places where you know that uh, the efforts are working? I mean, are there some things you could implement that are maybe already in place in other areas? Well, Houston probably has the most effective homeless program. It's called The Way Home, and I would urge anybody to go online and look at that program. Uh, they actually do some things that the commissioners are talking about, like housing first. And I didn't know if I agreed with that at first because Buncombe County has tried some housing first to where uh, they have taken that extremely hard to house population without holding them accountable to getting into treatment and moving forward and just tried to house them. And it's not been very successful. But how Houston does it is they use law enforcement as, as one of the legs of the stool to kind of effectively go about dealing with this housing situation and they don't allow anybody to live on the street in Houston. They move them into shelter or they use the, the law enforcement solution which may involve them getting some treatment in the jail. And, and we don't want the jail to be the catch basin for folks who have serious substance abuse issues and mental health problems. That's not what we're saying at all. But there, there is a portion of that population that just refuse to go into shelter and sometimes that that's the only way they're going to receive any treatment. But these folks go into shelter and they've had some really long-term success. Uh, Houston has the sixth largest homeless population in the country. In the past few years they've moved 16,000 people into shelters and permanent, what they refer to as permanent housing, which some of that is as, as apartments, but they've moved them towards jobs and treatment and 90 percent of the people in the past two years they've moved into shelter are still there and they're doing something right. So when I look at it and I, and I plan on learning more about it and I want, I want the folks that are funding this, which is you the taxpayer, to learn more about it. If we move towards that strategy, we've got to look at what are the differences and I can tell you one that's glaring. They use law enforcement as an effective partner instead of just hammering them day in and day out when they go out and try to make the community safer and make these arrests. That's, we've got to change that. It's very rare that county commissioners are very seasoned law enforcement professionals, a former, like, a former professional like you. I love the fact that you have that connection. I mean, do you feel like you'll be able to, to partner, leverage, communicate more uh, efficiently or effectively with law enforcement than, than a, a, your typical person on the county commission? I really think so. Uh, a, a lot of the push for me to run has come from law enforcement and they're certainly not the only folks, the business community and, and a lot of just community members that see the public safety in and around them degrading. Uh, I, I really, really hope so. And. Um, you know, Amanda Edwards, who is also running for this seat, and I want to point out, you know, I'm not running for Amanda's seat. Amanda's got two more years in, in her commission seat. She is just also running for a vacant position, which happens to be the chair. Um, so, yes, I think we can. And if one of the reasons why running for the chair interested me, uh, if we're going to do this, uh, is because the chair sets the agenda with the county staff's help and the chair can also drive them to go out and find out about uh, this program in Texas that's being very successful. And they can bring that information back and report. And, and the chair has a little bit more ability to get those things done and direct focus and direct the uh, discussion as to what the discussion is going to be. And I think that's going to be extremely important. You know, my thing's transparency. You're paying for it. You need to know what the, you know, what the options are, what the dynamics are. You need to hear it. Now, the direction that the commission decides to go, you may or may not agree with it, but you're going to know, and, and the onus needs to be on those folks that serve to explain their position and explain it well as to why they're going in the direction they're going, and that, that way there's way more transparency and understanding amongst everyone. So everyone is concerned about the economy and uh, it's expensive to, to run a county. And I've heard that there's a good bit of county debt that's being built up in Buncombe County. How do you plan to address that? How, how do you look at tackling that issue? I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this uh, a couple of ways in that 
there's not a lot of information and people are not very aware about what the county's spending their money on. Uh, the MacArthur Foundation, we have taken approximately $4.5 million from them since 2018. Where's that money going? How are we getting that out? Because part of the strategy is to get that money uh, involved and engaged in the community that's going to lower these people's need to go out and commit crime. Well, I don't know that it's necessarily been going in that direction. And what I would say is a, a lot of our issues, especially around downtown, uh, involve the homeless, involve that smaller percentage of the homeless folks who are uh, committing a lot of crime and and sometimes are, can be pretty violent and, and that causes a lot of concern. Uh, I don't know that that money's been going in that direction, but but what I want to see the commissioners do is have to assess, you know, where are we spending money? The article that I read that brought this to my attention said the county debt service or the money we owe, the interest we owe on what we've already spent is going to double between now and 2029. Mm -hmm. Now, the county manager has basically said that, you know, they're not going to have a tax increase, but there's other ways that they're going to be able to uh, get those taxes in or, or get that money in and one way is to do a reval which is coming up for the county another way is to do a uh, sales tax referendum to be able to you know tax on sales tax now of both of those two I think the sales tax probably is the more fair one in that you are taxing everybody that comes into and through Buncombe County and we're a huge tourist uh, uh, driven economy and I think you're being able to people's property, right, property right. Taxes. because you're going to make it and we've also got a real problem with workforce affordable housing you know the people that come here to work that make this economy turn every day they're finding it more and more impossible to live in this county because of, of tax value on property and what it costs to live here so I think that that discussion has got to be had in a meaningful way, and, and there's not a lot of focus on it. The article I read was the Asheville Tribune, uh, the reporter that did it. It's a very good, it seems to be a very, very on point in what she's looking at, but you don't see that in the, in the Citizen Times and some of these other uh, wider reaching news outlets or WLOS. And I, I think those things have to be discussed and people need to understand where their money's going. Uh, Al, Al Whiteside's one of the commissioners, and it was pretty, it was pretty telling to me when he said, "You know, we've really got to look at how we're spending our money. We've got to quit uh, using the the dynamic of who comes in and makes the most noise, and we fund the groups that make the most noise because those activist groups." Uh, that come in with a particular cause, you hear one side of the story and, and they've been funding a lot of these issues and that's why this debt service is going to grow. And that, we kind of need to understand that better and we need to make sure we don't continue on that track and then we also need to hear about how we're going to pay for what we've already bought. Van, I'm sort of a middle of the road Republican. I've always seen you as sort of a middle of the road Democrat. Yeah, that's where I've always and, been. Know, the world needs both, and and and, and you know, one of the things that's come up a good bit where our, our conversation here is the the term activist and left leaning activist. I do not agree with the far right, and there's such a tiny little smidgen of them. But the left seems like the far left is really growing big time. Uh, maybe this is a bad question to ask, but. Do you see yourself as somebody that can can kind of help bring the the sensible middle to terms with one another and to help each other out and to make sure their communities are strong and that we all get along and prosper? I mean, do you see yourself as that kind of person? That's my goal. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough job. I think we've allowed uh, the microphone for both extremes of the party to be too loud and we're not hearing from centrists yeah. like us. And let's face it, we're really the people who pay for it. We're the middle class who go out and work every day, and we've seen that paycheck start start to shrivel as far as what it buys in the way of food and gas and how we're able to provide for our families. I see us in the middle. We're paying the ticket. 
we need to have a voice. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as Commissioner Whiteside says, many times our elected commissions and council tend to veer towards the loudest voices in the room. They're not the most, as far as numbers go, they're not the biggest numbers in the community, but they're the loudest voice in the room. And we've got to veer away from that, and we, we've got to be brave and have those discussions because the extremes of both can bring a lot of pressure. And here in Asheville, I mean, let's just be honest, we're saying both, but here in Asheville, it's that far left activist movement that brings the pressure, and uh, they, they, can, they can make it very uncomfortable for an elected leader uh, to push back. And especially here when all of them are Democrats, and I don't think one party rule helps anybody. Uh, I don't think it helps any, any organization or any group when all the voices are monolithic and sound the same or pressured into being that. Uh, so that's my goal, and that's what I'm trying to do, and I'm going to need a lot of help. And the first big hurdle is getting these signatures. Uh, got to be 8,124 was the number I was given. It will actually be based off 4% of the registered voters in Buncombe County as of January 1. So that number may, may flex a little bit, but we're shooting for 10,000 signatures because the Board of Elections has to certify those signatures. Some, you know, they will sign differently than how they're registered. There'll be some problems there. There always is. There's never been a successful petition campaign in a major way in Buncombe County that has succeeded. So uh, I know the lift is heavy. I'm going to need your help. Uh, the folks out there listening to this, I'm going to need the help of your families. But if you're in that centrist group that goes to work every day, sees things going in a bad direction, and wants somebody up there to be a voice for you, help me get there. Remember, if nobody is on the ballot but the one person who's running for county commission chair, there will be no forms, there'll be no debate, there'll be no explanation about how money's being spent or what direction the commission intends on taking and solving these problems that we've talked about. By getting me on the ballot, we're gonna have discussion, we're gonna have debate, and you will know the direction the county commission's taking and how your tax money's being spent.